very high those are very high value uh, medications that are making real um, inroads towards the health of Americans. But those are um, ones that are commonly used. They're ones that um, will make the biggest impact, I think, in a lot of ways. That was a data-driven decision about the classes that they were going to um, allow for this to happen with. But we also have cancer drugs that um, are really making enormous impacts on patients' ability to live longer and healthier lives with fewer side effects. And so at what point can we start negotiating um, those down? I also would argue that um, Medicare is subsidized in no small part um, with it's subsidizing our um, postgraduate medical education programs and the NIH is being subsidized um, as well. And those programs are connected to how pharmaceutical drugs are getting out into the system. And so what if um, we didn't have NIH dollars that weren't subsidizing the development of these drugs, they would be even more expensive and yet despite our subsidizing them, we are still paying more than any other country on earth for these medications. What if there is some agreement about those subsidies, which literally are subsidies for manufacturing and, and they should be for research and development, but there should be some return on that um, investment for the American public. So I think I probably a little long-winded, but um, postgraduate medical training with Medicare dollars, as well as um, pharmaceutical investments through NIH and, and investments that the reason I say they're connected is because our academic medical centers are oftentimes um, tied with those um, developments in the research that's happening. And somehow the system has to become um, intertwined so that we are working together, not against each other. Thanks for that. Um, our next question um, is, should we make all healthcare delivery and drug manufacturing nonprofit? Should we make all delivery and manufacturing nonprofit? Yeah, should we make all healthcare delivery? So on the delivery side and then um, on the drug manufacturing side, should that be um, moved towards a nonprofit approach? You know, it's an interesting um, question. Um, one might argue that nonprofit is better for the system. Um, I think there are challenges with the, the nonprofit and the for-profit. Certainly nonprofits are benefiting from um, tax breaks, which give them an opportunity to deliver care at a more affordable price theoretically, and they deliver um, indigent care, care for those who are uninsured in our community. And it's an important, very clearly important um, mechanism. I personally am biased and think that for-profit institutions in healthcare are inherently going to be um, driven to bring shareholder returns and, and not prioritizing patient health. I think with deep regulations and outcome expectations, perhaps there could be room for a, a capitalist innovation there, but I will just share that I, I, do, I do believe that there needs to be more um, regulation there if we are going to allow for not for for profit um, in entities to expand. This is a real issue right now. We're in fact thinking about the corporate practice of medicine with a bill that we're discussing right now and the um, dramatic increase in private equity investments in not just hospitals but clinics and, and practices um, is leading to dramatically worse outcomes in some places and certainly um, decimating the practice of medicine for a lot of our practitioners. So I, I have a lot of concerns about for-profit entities in medicine, and there's probably ways that we could incentivize and regulate that if we really put our heads to it. Um, as far as pharmaceutical companies, I for us to get to a place where pharmaceuticals were nonprofit we would have to take on an enormous burden as a society um, for the development and ongoing um, evolution of the, the drug supply system. Um, I think that the competition that is happening right now, there's, there is definitely some health in that. Um, so how we would do that would 
potentially be amazing. And I think unless we were really robustly investing in it, we would not be able to keep up with the innovations that the United States has driven for a lot of the world. Um, and someone else, you know, would fill that gap almost certainly, but I'm not sure that it would necessarily be of benefit to Americans. So I, I would love to have a conversation with folks smarter than me on this to kind of understand how we would do that effectively. What I can say is right now, um, there's far too much um, profit being made in pharmaceuticals. It is an uncontrolled cost that um, until we get our hands around, we won't be able to truly get to an affordable healthcare system. If we had single payer, as I think many of us um, would agree is ultimately the best way to get to this, um, I think there's a lot more opportunity for um, investment and collaboration there, but I'm not sure that going immediately to not-for-profit pharmaceuticals makes sense to me unless we have a new revenue stream that would um, robustly invest in that and all the people who would help us run that um, would be a challenge right off the bat. Thank you for that. I wonder if I could go back. You, you mentioned briefly about the corporate practice of medicine, and I'm very curious, and I really appreciate your leadership and uh, you testifying um, uh, recently uh, in support of Ben Bowman's um, uh, thoughtfulness, uh, thinking about how we approach this. I was curious, uh, as the next step at a federal level, do you, uh, what steps do you think we need to be thinking about um, in regards to the intrusion of private equity and uh, some of these entities or corporations um, uh, stepping in between providers and patients? And, and where do you think we need to be looking forward to at the federal level? Yeah, I think what um, Representative Bowman's done in relatively short amount of time is, is quite um, courageous and certainly provocative. We are getting a lot of outreach um, from groups um, about this bill and um, some of it, you know, just well-meaning and, and partnership, and then others that are really concerned about what it could mean for, um, you know, private investment in the healthcare system. So the first thing I would say is that the, the red flag in this is that private equity is investing in healthcare. Private equity doesn't go where there's not a lot of profit to be made and in a relatively short amount of time. So the fact that physician groups, professional corporations are thought of as a money-making opportunity um, means that we have not aligned our incentives um, with the outcomes that we need. Um, the physician patient relationship and the ability to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because you're going to make more money or that you have to hit a certain um, RVU rate or whatever it is, has to be um, disincentivized. And what we are seeing is that private equity is investing in groups and then management of those groups is um, quickly leading to a different type of practice than a physician-driven organization would would lead to. So what this bill really is trying to do is just say um, the professional corporation has to be owned by clinicians at 51% or higher so that control main is maintained by the um, clinician group. That um, does not mean private equity can't invest. Um, I think in the long run, we need to figure out what it is that is um, incentivizing that investment and returning an investment and close those um, gaps. Because right now um, we need to incentivize physician practices and clinician practices. Um, and right now they're incredibly disincentivized. We are seeing enormous um, a major shift to employment of physicians rather than independent practices. So um, the hanging your shingle out uh, outside of your door and, and having a private practice is really um, a, almost a colloquialism at this point. It's just not realistic for the vast majority of people. So the regulations and the administrative burden is driving a lot of that. And so management companies taking that away also allows them to manipulate that. So we need to simplify things and incentivize um, clinician owned and operated um, practices again. I think if we do that, we'll be able to attract a lot of physicians and clinicians to Oregon that otherwise might not come. I'm really optimistic about that. That would be wonderful. Uh, it's hard to recruit. Um, so, 
Our next question is a little bit of a change. Um, you spoke briefly about the importance of housing to healthcare. What's your vision for housing policy that advances health outcomes, especially for low-income BIPOC communities? What is my vision for housing that incentivizes health outcomes? Sorry about that. But yeah, sorry. Um, we're doing this in short session, and I know this is tough. You've had a long day, so I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, let me read it. What's your vision for housing policy that advances health outcomes, especially for low-income and BIPOC communities? Great. Yeah, we we are continuing to work on this. We have disinvested from housing, public housing, since the Reagan era. So we have been for over 40 years um, decreasing and almost not investing in um, housing that's truly subsidized. What government should be doing in healthcare and housing and other things are the things that the local jurisdictions and the community cannot do for itself. And what we cannot do for ourselves is build affordable housing in a private market without major subsidies. Um, contractors have to pay, you know, workers. We want to have workforce that gets, you know, family wage jobs. They shouldn't be, you know, getting wage theft and, and underpaid. We want people to be able to work on the housing and make a living. And to do that with all the construction costs and the land costs and all the other things, you cannot build affordable housing, unless you're quite innovative. And we do have some thoughts about how we can do that better, but we have to be able to subsidize it. Um, and public housing, there's some pretty robust data that it's simpler and more effective to just invest in public housing and not have the tax incentives and all the other things that people have to pull together to get to a, an affordable project that actually is affordable and um, a builder wants to build. So the first thing I would say is that we've just got to invest more and we haven't. And the way that we can get BIPOC families and true um, economic justice in a fair economy is making sure that everyone has access to affordable housing in the community of their choice. And that might be very different for a student who is willing to share a room and you know, a single occupancy unit um, with a shared kitchen and a dorm-like situation, or it might be, you know, that three bedroom, two bathroom homes for every family is not realistic. And we need to think about uh, alternatives to that community living um, with co-ops and land trusts and things are, are absolutely um, um, opportunities for us. And what we need to just say is that we believe that housing is a right that people need to have access to it and that we as a community are willing to invest in that. And we used to do that and we have done it and government can do amazing things, but we have to make a choice and investing in this would cost a lot of money. We also are at this time where we have the most income inequity um, almost ever. It, I think I've heard different things, but you could argue that it's more than ever. And we have opportunities at the very highest tax rates um, to get to a marginal tax rate that is much higher than what we're seeing now in that investment or that revenue would pay for all the programs that we're needing um, to, in a lot of ways for housing and healthcare, we could get there. Um, so we just need to decide that that's a value that we are going to um, advance and support. And is it simple? Absolutely not. But we've seen more housing starts in Oregon in the last year with investments. We know that we can get there, but it's not, we haven't cracked the nut of keeping it affordable for everyone yet. Much work to be done. Our next question is um, uh, one of our, from our audience members is, should universal healthcare start in Congress or in individual states? Yeah. Um, Justice Brandeis called the states the, uh, and I'll, it's not exactly how he said it, but that we are the laboratories of um, the federal government, that the states will innovate and then the government, the federal government effectively will um, apply or expand or scale those innovations. Um, so I do think that there is an immense opportunity. Clearly, Oregon has been um, courageous and innovative, and we are getting right now a Medicaid 
1115 waiver that offers enormous opportunity that is due in no small part to the dedication that we've had to innovation and, and getting to value-based care. We are truly moving the needle. But um, as I said at the beginning, the federal preemptions that get in the way of true innovation are a challenge. Um, for me to get to a global budget pilot, which really is having all the different participants in the market on a capitated per member per month or per patient per month um, rate that is, um, or reimbursement that is adjusted for their illness and age and all that. Um, we can't get there because Medicare is a federal program and we would need to have a Medicare waiver from CMS to do that. We can't do it with our um, ERISA plans and you know our, our um, corporate plans that are not controlled by the state. So we do need cooperation. I, I don't know that a one size fit, fits all right out of the gate for single payer is something that I believe can happen. I think we are going to need to get to durable policy. We need to have pilot projects, find out what works, and then scale it. Um, and I think the states are a wonderful place to do that. So I actually do believe in state-driven innovation, but we have to have the full buy-in of the federal government to be able to get there. Great. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Just to follow up on that, do you, as far as uh, as Sabuka, um, I assume, or not to make assumptions, but would that be a position you would support for that legislation federally? I'm sorry, so Sabuka. Oh, so yeah, it's the state-based universal health care um, and just a, a, a tool uh, that would allow uh, states to be more innovative. Yeah, I do think that it makes a lot of, and sorry, the acronyms sometimes are um, a challenge for me. So um, so absolutely, I think that is a state-based universal care um, system is where we're trying to get to. The problem is that we haven't gotten rid of fee-for-service um, billing. Um, so we, no matter if you say everyone gets care, everyone can um, have access unless you actually change the incentives in the system, um, getting rid of low value care and incentivizing preventative and upstream engagement or in investments, we won't get there. Um, so if if it's truly um, capitate, capitated and prepaid and um, the insurance companies are at risk if they can't manage to the care, um, we won't be able to get there with them. My apologies for acronyms and everything. No. I, I'm in the business sometimes and I hear these and I'm like, what are we talking about as well? So <laughs> I feel you. Our next question from the audience. Um, and and um, I'm sure you could fill this in on more of this construct too, but do you think there's uh, more space where schools could be used as local clinics? You know, there are school-based clinics, but perhaps maybe you could see, is there a space for expansion of that or, or what's your position on that? I love it. That's my um, personal bill this session. I, If I could be the decider um, today, I would put a school-based health center um, literally in every middle school and high school. Elementary schools should be smaller. I don't think that they'll sustain. But the amazing things about this are, number one, um, having clinic space is one of the challenges to a healthcare delivery system right now. It's expensive to build clinics. It's hard to staff them. With telemedicine, we actually have opened up a whole new world in a lot of ways where you can have an attending clinician who is overseeing multiple nurses, nurse practitioners. It can be different um, levels of um, clinicians in a school-based health center and still have the ability to deliver care at the point of where children are and their families. And I think that some of the major reasons that this is such a smart investment is number one, um, the buildings are already there. You don't have to put the capital into building new clinics. Two, they're community-based. Um, your schools are going to have culturally competent language accessible care um, in the school that can absolutely be translated. If you're in a community where um, Vietnamese is the primary um, second language spoken, you probably are going to be able to invest in translators who are going to help um, with families there in a different way than you would in a community outside of that area. 
Um, next, we do have telemedicine. So it used to be a much different challenge to have a school-based health center um, because you couldn't see enough patients to make ends meet. But now if you have a nurse um, who could be a school-based nurse or it could be a clinic-based nurse, um, who has the ability to work with through telecommunication with an attending provider who can prescribe and do all the things, um, you are able to offer a whole host of other um, supports. Next, social work. You know, the school is a trusted um, building. I think a lot of, especially for some of our most marginalized community members, undocumented family members and whatnot, they are going to feel much more comfortable coming into a school and getting care in our school-based health centers aren't just for children, they're for the community. Anyone can go into a school-based health center, family, um, neighbors, and being able to enter a school and feel safe is different than walking into a county clinic, which is um, pretty intimidating for some of our most vulnerable members. And then lastly, you know, many of our families are having to work both if you have a two parent household or, you know, there's a challenge getting a child from school to an appointment and that can be transportation related. It can be many other challenges if they're in the school and they can literally walk to their clinic for their appointment. Um, we make it much more accessible and more likely that they'll have access to that preventative care. Um, we used to do BCG and TB um, tests in schools and it, the schools used to be a much more um, integrated component of our public health system. And I think we need to get back to that. Thank you so much for talking about the value of uh, that as a resource in, in our healthcare system um, and that connection to our, our kids. Um, our next audience uh, question um, is, do you think that we need greater transparency in medical pricing? And should anyone need to pay at the time of medical need? If people have to pay to walk in the door, which does happen in a lot of ways, um, we are disincentivizing accessing care. And what we are doing is um, leading to delayed care um, for folks when you know that it's gonna cost you $250 to get a CT scan that's going to screen for the cancer that was removed and may come back. Um, patients will defer on that because they're making, as I said at the beginning, impossible decisions about whether to get their health care or pay for food or, or rent. Um, we need more robust um, financial assistance programs. We need to make um, policies truly affordable. Our high deductible plans with enormous out-of-pocket costs are in, are in a lot of ways disincentivizing patients from accessing the care that they need. So again, we have set up a system that disincentivizes preventative care. And so when those delays happen, people end up in the emergency room with complications and far worse outcomes. And we know that the quality adjusted life years. And, you know, we can argue about whether that's a good um, marker of um, effectiveness, but we know that patients um, who don't have access to robust healthcare coverage have worse outcomes. And so it seems like a no brainer to me that everyone should have full access to um, healthcare and that it shouldn't be dependent on whether or not they're willing to make impossible choices if they have preventative care. So um, absolutely we should have cost transparency. People should know what it's gonna cost them. I can't tell you, and I'm sure Dr. German, you've had the same thing where patients are astounded at a bill that they get. Um, we know that bankruptcy, the number one driver of it is unexpected medical costs in our country. We have way too many challenges from accessing medical care to the economic stability of our society. It is unacceptable, it's unethical, and we need to do something about it. Our next question is, what is the single biggest factor that makes American healthcare more expensive than the rest of the industrialized countries? The single biggest factor, I'm sure that there's a right answer to this. Um, and I would say that it's more complicated than a single answer. Um, we have too many competing interests for making money there's too many levels at which 
profit can be made in our system, whether it's a pharmacy benefit manager or multiple insurers. Um, there has to be competition in our system. And that isn't always a bad thing, but it is unregulated to the point where people are figuring out ways to make money off of um, the system. So um, I believe that fee-for-service medicine and the way that we reimburse for healthcare is the number one driver in many ways, because it's also connected to how we use pharmaceuticals and, and many other things. Um, you might argue that the complexity of our system and all of the um, administrative burden that is in it is a major driver. But I think these things are connected, that we have too many different um, groups that are able to profit off of healthcare, um, and that those interests drive cost up at every level um, in a way that is unsustainable and clearly not affordable. Thank you. Next question is, what additional benefits should we include in Medicare? Well, we should certainly cover the cost of medications. Um, there are, yes, there are benefit plans right now, but we don't fully cover at a level that many of my patients can afford. Um, we have challenging decisions to make around access to coverage. Um, many people are asking for Azempic or other weight loss medications right now. And um, people might argue that that is going to help the system. I, I think that um, there's a lot of challenges with that. So I, I don't believe universal access to everything is actually the right answer. I think Oregon has done it right in a lot of ways with having um, a tiered model of what is fully funded and, and where things are more um, um, cost shared with the patients or may not be accessible. Um, and that list, the prioritization list is critical because we can take into account prevention and other um, important um, investments from a system perspective. Um, and be thoughtful about when we expand coverage um, to things that are clearly data-driven and life-saving. Um, there are nice-to-haves and there are must-haves. And I think as a system, we can't just say that everything should be covered because I do think that Americans um, tend to expect different things from their medical system than in other countries. Um, for instance, at the end of life, we spend far too much um, doing things to people that doesn't improve their outcomes. I know the vast majority of my patients don't wanna die in the hospital. And yet I'm a critical care physician where many people um, suffer for weeks, months sometimes, um, trying to be kept alive and then ultimately um, pass. And whether that's intentional as they go um, more towards hospice or unintentional, we as a society, by covering everything, are propagating use of medical interventions that are extremely expensive and not helping people live a healthier life. And that is a really challenging ethical question about how we, we, we value personal autonomy um, very greatly as Americans. So I'm not sure that universal coverage of everything actually makes sense in a system where we're trying to cover everyone, um, but it would require us to make some pretty challenging decisions. So preventative care should be um, without any question fully funded medications that are for you know um, those disease processes that clearly are not elective need to be fully funded. We should not have cost sharing to the degree that we have um, with Medicare. Um, but then there's some of these other things that we're doing at the end of life and um, with medications that I'm not sure makes sense that I would say should fully be funded with Medicare. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dexter. I, I see we're arriving towards the end of our hour here, and this has been a really enjoyable and delightful conversation with you. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining uh, with us this evening and, and sharing your thoughts on some really tough questions and in short session with <laughs> a lot of work that you're doing. Um, I, would you like to tell our audience uh, how to reach you, your campaign, if you have additional, if they had additional questions or comments for you? 
Thank you so much for asking. Um, so yes, my website is MaxineForOregon.com. We would be delighted to have folks. Um, you can reach out to us through email that's on uh, the website. And clearly there's other information there as well. So thank you so much. Well, thank you again. And, and I regret to the audience, you know, there's so many great questions out there. We didn't have enough time to, to get to all of them. Um, remember your registration for this series allows you to view all sessions of the Conversations with Candidates 2024. Uh, please visit our website, www.pnhporegon.com uh, for the upcoming schedule and to learn more about Oregon PNHP. Uh, you may view recordings of this and our other sessions at our website a few days after each session. I now turn it back to Ted Kay, our City Club host, to close the evening. Thank you, Maxine, for sharing your thoughts on health care policy. We especially thank our audience for engaging in this important discussion. And finally, we thank our co-sponsor, Oregon PNHP, for arranging this forum. On Wednesday, February 28th at 5 p.m., City Club will host an online candidate forum with three candidates for District 3. More information will be on our website tomorrow. And on Tuesday, April 2nd at 5.30, we will host a webinar debate between the two candidates for Multnomah County District Attorney, Mike Schmidt and Nathan Vasquez. I encourage everyone to visit the City Club website at pdxcityclub.org to learn more about us and our events. Membership is open to everyone. And please join us for similar programs to tonight on the next two Tuesdays, February 20th with Lynn Peterson and February 27th with Sushila Jayapal. If you wish, please complete the short questionnaire that will be sent to you via email following tonight's session. And thank you again, Maxine, for joining us. Everyone stay safe and stay well. Good night.